Alrighty guys, so chapter 5 is about the progress of going from the colonists being happy to going to the American Revolution. We start with everything being all fine in 1750 to within a 26 year time span writing the Declaration of Independence and uh, fighting a revolutionary war. That's what chapter 5 starts out with. Let's go through the story. So the story starts actually with a conflict between Great Britain and France. Again, the year is about 1750 and Great Britain and France have actually started to bicker with each other over certain things going on in the empires. Um, specifically, there's one area where there's actually a really big contention. That area is going to be um, the Ohio Valley Territory. So what's happening here is that the American colonists, who are mainly farmers, are going to start wanting to get more land to farm. So they're going to start pushing westward. As they push westward, they're going to run into a lot of the territory. The problem is this territory is controlled by the French, and also there's a lot of Native Americans there. As you can guess, there's going to be some contentions. Uh, some small fighting is going to ensue, and almost immediately, the American colonists are recognizing that a full-blown war is on the verge of breaking out. One of these uh, people that notices this is going to be this dude named... Ben Franklin, and he's going to make something, he's going to help call for something called the Albany Congress. And basically the idea of the Albany Congress was, hey, us colonies need to work together in case a war breaks out, we should protect each other. Um, they draft a document called the Albany Plan of Union, which pretty much says that exact idea. Um, but none of the colonial legislatures actually approve of it. So it's this idea for the colonies to unite together to defend themselves, but it's never actually going to come to fruition, despite the political cartoon, which you can see here in the lower right, that um, Ben Franklin drew. Despite the fact that he thought it would be a good idea for the colonies to unite together, they don't yet. But the Albany Congress was right about one thing. A full-on war is brewing. That war is called the French and Indian War. So this war is actually not that complicated to understand. Remember what's going on here. The American colonies are trying to grow and expand. They have a lot of people that are living here. They're trying to grow and expand and they're going to start taking over the Ohio Valley Territory. The problem is that's controlled by the French. So a fight's going to break out and it's important to remember at the start of this fight it is British soldiers versus French soldiers in North America. The American colonists are actually not involved in this war at the outset. And things are not going well for the British. In fact, they're not going well for the British at all. So, eventually, after about almost a year of the British getting their butts kicked, the uh, or sorry, a new commander is going to come into power in Great Britain. His name is William Pitt, and he's going to make a promise to the colonists. He tells the colonists that if you fight in this war, you will not have to pay for it. Now again, perhaps you've never heard of this before, but I'm going to tell you this is the crux of the American Revolution right here. The American soldiers, oh, drop something. The American soldiers are going to fight in this war, and this is actually going to be a well, it's not going to be an immediate success. There's going to be still there's still going to be some problems, but the American soldiers help turn the tide for the the British, and the Americans and the British are going to win this war. The Treaty of Paris in 1763 is basically going to have the French agree to give up all colonial land claims um, east of the Mississippi River. Now granted, that's there's going to be this Louisiana thing later, that's a whole other story. And they're really going to leave the area, or so they're told. There's going to be some stuff that's happening in, in a little while, but that's, that's another story. Again the North Americans are going to win. So everyone's expecting this should be a great, great cause and a great celebration across the entire country, right? Well, hmm. A big reason why there isn't a huge celebration in the American colonies is because of this king. This guy, King George III, is young, he's impetuous, he thinks he knows everything. And he's going to make some really strange decisions that are going to upset the colonies. He doesn't trust his advisors, he thinks he knows what he's doing, and he's going to make a pretty bad decision almost immediately. The first bad decision he makes is called the Proclamation of 1763. Now, what this says, this says that the American colonists are not allowed to go over the Appalachian Mountains and settle this Ohio Valley Territory. 
Think about how unpopular this decision would be. The American colonists have just fought and died for the right to use this land and the right to make more money, get more farmland for better opportunities. And then the king says, no, you can't go in there. Even though you just fought a seven-year war for it, you can't go in there. The American colonists are going to be upset. But let's think about this from the king's perspective. What He has to fund a huge, giant army to protect the colonists. If they move over the Appalachian Mountains too soon, they're going to run into the, the remaining French that are still there, and they're going to run into a bunch of Native Americans. No one's going to be happy with them being there. So, from the king's perspective, he's doing this as a means of saving money. But, to the American colonists, they are going to be very upset over the fact that they could not use this land. Almost immediately, the king had a problem. He had to pay for this war. But, again, because according to Pitt's promise, the colonists wouldn't be responsible for paying this war since they helped to fight it, the king has a really hard time trying to figure out how is he going to get raise any money. He can't tax the colonists, but he needs to raise money. And, side note, he really can't tax the British citizens because they're being taxed extremely heavily by this point in history. In fact, they're the most, the most taxed people in history up to this point. So, the king's got a little bit of a problem. As such, the king's going to go out of his way to try to find colonists that aren't playing by the rules that are in place. Colonists that are buying illegal goods or smuggling illegal goods or um, not buying things from within the empire. If you buy something from outside of the empire, you are costing the king money. So, the king is going to pass something called writs of assistance. These are designed, um, that way a British officer, a British soldier, can search a colonist's house at any time he wants, looking for illegal or smuggled goods that were obtained outside of the empire. If that was done, there could be fines and everything else. The main thing you have to know about writs of assistance is that they are another means of trying to enforce mercantilism on the colonies. The colonists also saw these as a violation of their rights of Englishmen. They should be protected in their property and not have a government just come and take it away from them. Oh, but the writs of assistance were just the first of many things that the king does to bother and pester the colonists. The next one is going to be the Sugar Act. Now again, as we discussed, sugar is actually not just used here for food. In fact, because the water in colonial America was actually not really all that healthy, most uh, beverages that are drank in the empire are actually going to be alcoholic in nature because the alcoholic content of the beverage is actually going to make the water or the liquid safer to drink. So if you're going to be making alcohol, you need sugar in order to do it. What this tax really came down to was this was not just a tax on you know, making our food taste better. It's actually a tax on the water, or sorry, the liquid that we are drinking. Let's not call it water. The liquid that they are drinking. The Sugar Act is what we call an indirect tax. The reason why we say that is the fact that the average American colonist is not paying this tax. It is the people that are shipping sugar that are paying for this tax not the actual average American colonist. So, this tax is considered indirect. But still, the American colonists are going to be really upset that they're paying any sort of tax at all. Sugar costs a little bit more money, but it shouldn't have to. This is seen as a violation of the rights of Englishmen and a violation of the uh, Pitt's promise. So, what do the Americans do whenever uh, there is a tax that they don't like imposed upon them, they start either illegally smuggling or boycotting sugar. Both work so well, both the boycotts and the illegal smuggling, that the king is almost immediately going to back off and say, okay, well this isn't a good idea, and he's going to come up with another idea for raising revenue. So, with the boycotts mounting, the Sugar Act doesn't work. The king is going to have to find another way to raise revenue. How is he going to do it? Well, he's trying to find something that the colonists are going to use at a pretty regular interval. What better to use in this case than paper? Paper 
is going to become pretty ubiquitous in the colonies, and people are using it for pretty much everything, especially for all these you know, new land and other things that are going to be expanding out westward. So why not start taxing paper? And that's essentially what the king does. The Stamp Act is going to be a tax on pretty much all paper used in the colonies. I'm talking paper that is used for newspapers, documents, licenses, legal forms from the British, forms of payment, pretty much any way that paper could be used in the colonies is going to require that it has a stamp, um, a basically a royal stamp. And every time you use that stamp, you're going to be charged for it. Now, you may have noticed something. I'm saying the colonists here. The colonists themselves are going to be directly responsible for paying for this tax. This is called a direct tax. This isn't indirect like the Sugar Act. The colonies themselves are directly paying this tax. And immediately they're going to be upset over it. Why? Because again, this is a violation of Pitt's promise. They were told they would not have to do this. So they're going to be pretty upset. In fact, no way to sugarcoat it. Get, get the joke. Um, it's actually going to be, <laughs> um, there's going to be riots that break out pretty much all across North America. Um, tax collectors are going to be taken from their homes, and in the very least, they're going to be threatened. In some of the uh, worst case scenarios, there's actually going to be physical punishments done to the tax collectors. Almost immediately after this starts happening, a group called the Sons of Liberty forms, and they try to organize these protests. It's not going to do the American colonists any good if a bunch of British officers are killed uh, in protest. That's just going to make the king even more upset. So the protests need to be more organized and perhaps less violent. That's where the Sons of Liberty comes in. The colonies themselves are going to actually try to meet again in something we call the Stamp Act Congress. And they're going to try to meet again and say how upset they are. But again, there's something really important to note here. The American colonists still want to be British citizens. We, in 1765, pretty much no one, save for a few revolutionaries, are saying that America needs to be an independent country from Great Britain. The American Revolution is 11 years away, and at this point, all they want is for the king to get rid of all of these bad things and to go back to the way things were before. By the way, I'm saying the king a lot here, but you could also say parliament. They pretty much are working together on this right now. Well, the colonies are going to organize a boycott of all British goods. If they're going to say, they're going to say, fine, if you're making us play by these games and we don't want to do it and they're unfair and you're breaking the law, then we're just not going to buy anything from you. It's going to basically be, we're going to ignore you. We're going to have a full boycott. In fact, 40% of all trade in the British Empire came through North America. So if North America decides they don't want to play, that could really bankrupt the British, which is the not something that they need. So, the king, parliament, whoever you want to call it, is going to get rid of the Stamp Act and say, okay, fine, that was a mistake, it's gone. They repeal it. But as they repeal the Stamp Act, they pass another act called the Declaratory Act. What this act says, it basically gives parliament the power to um, legislate over any colonial issue, which essentially means that anything going on in the, colon in the colonies can be legislated by parliament. It kind of really takes the power away from the colonial legislatures and really suspends this idea of salutary neglect. William Pitt's going to die, and when he dies, well, there's going to be some new leadership in town in Great Britain. Our new real, let's call him an enemy because we're not going to like him. His name is Charles Townshend, and he's going to go out of his way to try to find new ways to tax the colonies. The first one's actually pretty ingenious, but also kind of devious. He's going to say that it costs so much money to have housing for the soldiers. So what if we passed a law, and let's call it the Quartering Act, what if we passed a law that said that the American colonists would have to pay to house the soldiers? And on top of that, if a soldier stopped at some random colonist's house, that colonist would have to pay that soldier and feed that soldier and clothe that soldier the, you know, for as long as the soldier was there. Now, the implication here is, oh, you should be so happy that the soldiers are here to protect your property. But really what this comes down to, it's just a way of the British saving money, and it's another indirect tax on the American colonists. By the way, do you think the soldiers stayed in the uh, 
small out of the way houses oh no they'd stay in the nice houses of the rich which is going to make the rich even more upset oh but townshend wasn't done there he decides he still needs to raise more money and he's going to pass a new act as a way of getting money for the king and again he doesn't even sugarcoat it by calling him get it again okay he doesn't even try to mask it by calling it something else he's going to call this the revenue act it's designed to gain revenue and what this is going to be this is going to be a indirect tax on pretty much every item that the colonists are using it's going to be a tax on glass paint lead paper tea hmm, and other things that are imported into the colonies now the tax is going to be done indirectly but the point of the tax is going to be the same as the others this is going to be seen as offensive to the american colonists because even though it's an indirect tax, it's still a tax, which they were told they were not going to have to pay. This is the first time you start hearing words and phrases like no taxation without representation. And what started out a couple years ago is a minor movement about, about protesting against Parliament and the King is going to become a bigger and bigger and bigger movement. So much so that boycotts are going to increase across the colonies again and many of the townshend duties are going to be removed except for one but I'll get there in a second let's keep our story going in order now we've discussed the Boston Massacre before but I'll give you a quick little recap of it what essentially is happening here is a bunch of well basically teenagers are going to be protesting outside of a tax collector's house in Boston a couple of soldiers are called up to be there to protect the tax collector. A little fight breaks out because the American colonists start throwing snowballs. Somebody, somebody else fire, not the British general, and the American soldiers are going to be fired on. Or sorry, the American colonists are going to be fired on by the British soldiers. When this is over, five colonists are dead, six more are wounded, and really it's a big, giant misunderstanding but this is going to inflame the city of Boston and it's going to show the rest of the colonies that there are some bad things going down and maybe that the British government cannot be trusted. After the Boston Massacre, the colonies are going to start thinking, wow, maybe it's a good idea if we start you know, working together more. The king is getting more and more violent. Things are getting more and more treacherous. Things are not going well in the colonies. So, a group's going to form called the Committees of Correspondence. This really served two purpose, purposes. One, it was to have the colonists have a chance to talk to each other. But two, what would happen in a Committee of Correspondence is that one got, a committee would meet and then every town would send a representative to this committee. The representative would hear what was going on and then he would go back to the town and tell everybody what had happened. It's basically a way of spreading information before Facebook and Twitter. Okay. So, the Townshend duties, or the Revenue Act, is going to be taken apart, all except for um, the Tea Act. The Tea Act is going to remain. It's going to be a tax on tea. Now, the real reason why the Tea Act is kept in place is that one of the things that the British Empire is able to produce outside of the American colonies is tea. Most of the tea that the British are drinking is coming from India. So, what the Tea Act does, the Tea Act basically forces Americans to buy tea solely from the British East India Trading Company, which again is going to mean for the British that they keep the empire intact. If you ask me, this is just another means of supporting mercantilism. But to the American colonists, this is going to be seen as another illegal tax. So they're going to try to boycott tea and boycott these goods. Which leads us to the Boston Tea Party. A large group of rebels is going to dress up as Native Americans and they're going to go as a means of protest and destroy this tea. Again, there are some other side stories here, but really all that matters for what's going to happen next is the fact that they are protesting this tax on tea by destroying tea and throwing it into the Boston Harbor. What really matters about this story is how the British respond. The British are going to respond with something called the Intolerable Acts. The response to the Boston Tea Party is dire for the city of Boston. The Intolerable Acts have five different steps to them. I'll discuss them all pretty quickly and we will move on. The first one's called the Boston Port Bill, which says the entire Boston Harbor is going to be shut down 
by the British government until the tea that was destroyed is paid for. Problem, of course, being that everyone in Boston is working in shipping and trading. If you shut the harbor and you shut the port, there's no way that they could actually make money to pay back this loss of tea. Not that they do it anyway. So that's a problem. Number two, Massachusetts Government Act. This is going to revoke the colony charter and give the royal governor all authority over the area. So basically, this is a complete suspension of salutary neglect, and the colonists in Boston are essentially going to be controlled directly by the king. Next, the Administration of Justice Act. Now, this is actually a tie back to the Boston Massacre, but what this says is that any soldier or person charged with murder while enforcing the Intolerable Acts is going to face trial in Great Britain. Even though the guys that uh, had a trial in North America ended up having a fair and just trial, it doesn't matter. The king is going to basically give a, I don't know, a blank check, I guess is a way to describe it. Basically uh, tell that the soldiers can do whatever they want and that they're not going to face punishment because if they were to kill a colonist, well, they'll be tried for the crime back at home. And back at home, they're probably going to be cheered, not actually put on trial. Number four, the new Quartering Act says that any empty buildings in the city of Boston can be taken over by the royal governor for use as military barracks, which again, businesses are going to shut down. Any business that shuts down can be taken over by the government in this city. So this is going to be even more egregious to the people. Finally, the Quebec Act. Now, there's going to be an area on the uh, northwest side of the American colonies and the idea was that the American colonies, i.e. especially the New England states, would be able to grow and get bigger and moved westward. The Quebec Act is basically going to take that away from them and take away possible land. The city of Boston is going to be mainly targeted in all these acts and it's going to be really really difficult for them. But at the same time this is going to show the rest of the colonies that the king is not messing around anymore and that if you rebel, bad things are going to happen to you. So how are the colonists going to respond? Now, the response of the American colonists is going to be one that you might not expect. They're basically going to tell the king why they're not happy, but at the same time, they're basically going to say, hey, let's work this out. Let's organize back together. We don't want to fight. We want to be British citizens. Let's stop all of this fussing and fighting. They're going to draft a document. Oh, wait, by the way, who are these colonists? Well, the colonists are going to send representatives to meet in something called the First Continental Congress. And they're basically going to be representatives from each colony that explain what's happening in their colony. They're going to write a document called the Declaration of Rights and Grievances, and they're going to send it off to the king. The Declaration of Rights and um, Grievances is essentially going to say, hey, these are the things that are going on. Can you stop doing them? Can we go back to the way things were? It's also kind of a veiled threat. It's basically saying that, hey, look, we're not happy, and a rebellion's going to come, maybe, if this doesn't work. Now take a look at the date. It is 1774. We are still a ways off from the Declaration of Independence. So what happens? Well. As we know, it takes a little while for a response to come back from the king. The First Continental Congress disbands, they go home, and they wait for the king's response. Six months later, this is the response. It is now April 1775, and uh, the British respond by bringing in a whole bunch more troops into Boston. The response of the king is to say, fine, if you even dare even mention the word rebellion, we're basically going to threaten war against you. The actual Battle of Lexington and Concord is outside the scope of this class, so you are more than welcome to read about it, but this is the start of the American Revolutionary War. Well, about a month later, Congress is going to meet again. We'll call them the Second Continental Congress because that's what they are. They decide to send another petition to the king. It's called the Olive Branch Petition. The Olive Branch Petition, of course, has a biblical reference to it. It is a reference to uh, the story of Noah's Ark, where... Um, Things are going real bad, the, the flood is over, Noah sends out a dove, the dove comes back with an olive branch, it's a sign that the flooding is over and that humanity can keep going. So the colonists are basically going to do the same thing. They're going to send a letter to the king and say, hey look, we're not asking for much here. We only want three things. A ceasefire in Boston, a repeal of the Intolerable Acts, and to guarantee us the rights of Englishmen. 
That's all we want. All we want is a guarantee of the rights of Englishmen. Let's work this out. We don't want to fight you. Meanwhile, as soon as they send that letter, they're actually going to go ahead and announce General George Washington to be the commander-in-chief of the uh, American army. And they're basically going to wait a couple months to see if anything has changed. While they wait for the king's response, a very important book is going to be written in the colonies. This book is called Common Sense. It is published in January 10th of 1776, written by a revolutionary named Thomas Paine. Now, Common Sense is actually probably the best title for a book ever. The idea here is that most Americans still, even despite all the stuff going on, most Americans are still pro-British. What common sense does, it uses very simple language and tells the Americans, word for word, what, basically any response to an argument about staying with the king. It's going to give a detailed explanations about why America is actually worse off because of staying with the king and how America be can become a prosperous, self-sustaining government on its own. This is going to be one of the most popular books in the um, American colonies. Three out of every four males have a copy within two, within three months, I should say. Wait, let me say that again. Within three months, one out of every four males have a copy, but upwards of three out of every four males have read this book. This is one of the most widely read books in all of America, except, of course, for the Bible being the most read. This is going to change public opinion of the American Revolution. It is now June of 1776, and the king has not really sent a response, and now the American public, more so than ever, is getting ready for, Amer for independence. This gentleman, named Richard Henry Lee, is going to propose a resolution on independence on June 7th, 1776. His resolution states, and again, if I, I probably should have kept the exact wording, but it basically says that the American colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states and that they should no longer have a connection to Great Britain. That's a heck of a statement. In fact, it's such a crazy statement that all of the delegates in the Second Continental Congress have to go home and ask their families, friends, and constituents if they agree. If Richard Henry Lee's resolution is agreed to, America is officially at war. It is no longer a British colony. This is a crazy, crazy thing to consider. So, all the men go home and they ask their uh, colonies if they agree to Richard Henry Lee's resolution. Meanwhile, a document is going to be drafted, you might know it as a Declaration of Independence, to explain to the world why we want to declare independence. I want to make sure this is perfectly clear. The resolution that we are voting on is given by Richard Henry Lee. He gives that resolution on June 7th. The delegates go home to discuss with their constituents if they agree. Meanwhile, a document is going to be drafted by these gentlemen, namely Thomas Jefferson, as a means of telling the world and telling the king why we are going to be independent and vote for our independence, assuming we do. Now, it's going to take a little bit of time to actually uh, get that vote to come through, but in the meantime, let's take a quick look at the document. I could spend an entire month talking about the Declaration of Independence, but instead I'm going to keep this really simple. The Declaration of Independence has three main things that I want you guys to remember. The first main idea is the argument of natural rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It sounds a lot like John Locke because it basically was copied from John Locke. Number two, this idea called popular sovereignty. It's going to come up again later, but for now, just know that popular sovereignty means that the people rule. The people rule the government, not the other way around. Number three. Uh, the right of revolution. The very end of this document says that if a government should become destructive of these ends, it is the right and duty of the people to overthrow and abolish it. If a government can't protect your natural rights, it should cease to exist. That's what the document says. On July 2nd, 1776, Congress comes back in session and they decide to have a vote on Richard Henry Lee's resolution. And on July 2nd, 1776, the resolution is, is approved in Congress and officially North America has declared its independence. You can now call them the United States of America if you would. But where does July 4th come from? Well. 
The declaration itself is going to be argued over for the next two days as the wording is, is very carefully considered by the members of the Second Continental Congress. Eventually, on July 4th, 1776, the wording of the declaration is going to be approved. It is sent to a printer. That printer happens to write on the top, in Congress, July 4th, 1776, and that day stuck. Even though the declaration is not officially printed or even signed by everyone until several weeks later, at this point, we have declared our independence. And the reason why we celebrate it on July 4th is because of what was said on that document. But if you ask me, we should really be celebrating it on July 2nd. And you know what? We're Americans. We should be celebrating this every single day. So what happens after this document is signed? Oh, that is where things get really interesting. In chapter 6, we're going to go from the American Revolution, so we're actually going to fight the Revolutionary War, all the way up through the building of this country. And it turns out, building a country is kind of difficult. We actually fail at the outset. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's tell the story. Now, I'm going to briefly discuss the war, because again, in AP US, the war itself isn't drastically important. What's important is to know why is this war fought. So obviously this war is fought for American independence. That's what really matters here. But let's tell the story because we have the time. The colonists, you can really split up into three distinct groups. On the one hand, we have about a third of the colonies as what I would call loyalists, people that are loyal to the king. Sometimes they're called Tories. The other third of America are patriots or what we would also call Whigs. And then finally, the remaining third of America is relatively indifferent to this war. So that's something to consider. Really, only a third of America was gung-ho about this war. Most of America was like, eh, or not supportive at all. It makes the war effort a little bit more impressive when you think of it in that regard. Loyalists are going to have the military strength in this regard, though, because loyalists were actually normally former military veterans that were fighting from Great Britain, then they came to America and settled for the land. So they actually have a little bit of military strength here. Loyalists also had the support of African slaves because the British Empire has essentially decided to get rid of slavery by this point, and the American colonies, or I should say the United States at this point, are pretty much okay with keeping it. Let's see how this fight breaks down. Let's talk about the strength and weaknesses of each group. The British have about 11 million people they can call on, whereas the United States only has 2.5 million people, and a third of those people are loyalists. There are um, 110,000 trained soldiers, British soldiers, in America, and with 50,000 more mercenaries available to them. They are also the best, most experienced army and navy in the world, and have conquered almost the entire world at this point. However, there are some weaknesses here. They have a large navy, but it's so large that it's in disrepair. They have little to no experience on the North American terrain. And this is something that's always interesting in a war. If you're fighting a war outside of your own country, well, that means you have to bring everything you need with you, which makes it very difficult to supply your soldiers should it prove necessary. And finally, Parliament and the British citizens were not fans of this war to begin with. They didn't want this war to go down because they knew it was going to cost a lot of money. So there actually isn't a lot of public su support of this war in Great Britain. You think there would be, but there's really not. They'd almost rather get rid of us, truth be told. Now, let's talk about the United States. Now, what are the strengths and weaknesses of the United States? Well, they have about 350,000 men that are available to fight, even though not that many actually do. And most of these men, when they fight, are only going to serve for a really short term. Remember, most Americans are farmers. They can't be away from their farm for all that long. The U.S. also had home field advantage, which, just like in any sport, home field advantage really matters. It matters in a war, too. Why? Well, you know the terrain. Knowing the terrain is really, really important in a war. And perhaps most importantly, the United States did not need to win the American Revolutionary War. Really, all they had to do was not lose. The best parallel I can make to this is think about the wars that are currently being fought in the Middle East. 
it's not so much that um, the insurgents are winning in the Middle East. In fact, they're getting you know they're getting uh, beaten pretty decisively. The problem is they keep fighting, and then what happens is that the public support in America goes away. Same thing here. The the U.S. soldiers did not need to defeat the British. They had to just not lose for a long enough time to make the British citizens give up. And that's actually exactly what happens. What are some of the weaknesses of the United States? Well, they have basically no organization, no central government really at this point, no official army or navy. They had no money really to pay their soldiers or to get weapons. Um, they're going to have numerous, numerous losses and it's going to really hurt soldier morale. This is going to be a very tough war for them. They're, this is not looking good for the United States from the very outset. Okay, again, I'm going to go through a bunch of battles really quick here because there you don't really ever need to know all these specifics. It's good to know, obviously, and I'm not saying it's not important, but in regards to the AP exam and what you're going to be tested on, they're not going to expect you guys to be able to give me the specific dates of specific battles of the American Revolutionary War. What's more important, as always, is can you tell the story? Most of the fighting in the American Revolutionary War is going to take place in the north, in the northern, well, states now. They were colonies. Now they're going to take place. Why? Well, Boston's in the north. That's where most of the patriots and also, ironically, most of the loyalists are in the north. So that's where the fighting's going to take place. Let's go through a couple of these battles. First one, Bunker Hill. Um, really, this is not necessarily that much of a victory for the United States. Uh, they're going to lose important ground around Boston, which is where Bunker Hill is. However, they're going to inflict really heavy casualties, and at this point, they're going to be officially seen as in recognition. Again, notice the date, June of 1775. Now, we're looking for help from foreign countries, but they don't send that help right away. Um, but what they do send, especially the French, the French are going to send a general to us to basically um, check and see how the war is going. His name is General Lafayette. And really, if you want to think of it this way, he's kind of a spy for the French to see if the Americans are actually worth supporting. <clears throat> Fast forward to October of 1777. This is the Battle of Saratoga. The British are going to plan a major attack, but they are going to lose. So good for them. Um... As soon as this battle happens, and the United States has a pretty decisive victory, as soon as this happens, France and Spain decide to join the side of the colonists, which isn't too shocking when you think about it, because France and Spain are the other two big colonial powers. They actually have a vested interest in watching Great Britain fail. Next, we have Valley Forge in 1778. This is going to be a campground and training ground for American soldiers. Problem is, it's a bleak, cold hellhole. Many American soldiers are going to starve or basically freeze to death training here. They're also going to get some help from this guy named Friedrich von Steuben, who was a German soldier, who's basically going to help organize the colonial army. And once he comes in and kind of teaches the colonists how to fight, they become a much better fighting force and a much bigger opponent for the British. In the South, there's actually less real fighting going on here, but it's actually where the war is going to end. The British aren't doing too well in the North. They're not doing great. Oh, let's take it back. They're not doing terribly, but they're not doing too well in the North. So they're going to actually reassert and try to move their way back down through the South. There are less patriots in the South. So if they go down to the South and try to fight there, um, they're going to have less opposition to face. Unfortunately for the British, the South was no longer a safe, safe haven. Basically, they're not as loyalist as the as the British expected them to be. Leads us to the Battle of Yorktown. This dude named General Cornwallis, he is the British general, thought he would receive reinforcements from the sea, so he marched all of his troops towards the ocean. Unfortunately for him, the reinforcements do not come because they are going to be blockaded by the French. And that's actually what helps the Americans win the American Revolution. It's the French. I'm sorry, but we owe the French for us winning the American Revolution. I know, doesn't that stink? You'll have to think about that the rest of your lives. We owe the French. Now, the Treaty of Paris is going to be signed in 1783, and this is what it recognizes. Number one, 
the uh, Great Britain must recognize the independence of the United States. Number two, Great Britain is going to remove all troops from the United States. Number three, Great Britain forfeits all land east of the Mississippi River. And they don't really have any land west of it either. So this is just going to be a lot of land that's given up. Number four is going to sound really strange to you, but it's going to matter later. Great Britain is going to let the United States have fishing rights off the coast of Canada. That sounds like the silliest thing you've ever heard, but I guarantee you it will come up again in a couple weeks. And, more interestingly, more interesting, the Loyalists are not going to be punished. What ends up happening is that the Loyalists don't have their property taken away, don't have, um, they're not financially punished, but most of them actually do leave. Where do these Loyalists go? They go to Canada. That way they don't need to be part of the United States. Now, there are some flaws in this treaty. Number one, they do not settle the border with Spain, and there's going to be a fight over the uh, area of Florida coming up pretty soon for the new United States. State governments refuse to compensate loyalists for their property losses that happened during the war. War is destructive. Oops, you were a loyalist and your house blew up? Oh well. And also, there's a big group of people that happen to be hanging out in North America that are completely ignored in this treaty. Perhaps you've heard of them. They're called Native Americans. What are some results of this war? Well, the first is that 5% of all white males die in the colonies fighting this war. That's pretty big. Number two, over 50, or sorry, 500,000 natives are going to be killed. And the war is going to cost over $160 million, which the new United States does not have. This is going to be a major problem. Let's talk about some social considerations of this war. This is actually going to be pretty interesting. What's going to start happening is that this whole idea of class warfare and the differences between the rich and the poor actually kind of goes away during this war and a new idea springs up. We call it nationalism. Nationalism, nationalism basically means that you are proud of your nation. You're proud to be part of your nation. It, nationalism gets a really bad rap because of World War I, deservedly so, but there are some benefits to it. It's the difference between saying that you live in California or you're American. You know, you'd much rather be American than be a Californian, right? You know, there's no popular memes about California, but there's memes about being American. That's the difference. That's nationalism. But that has really interesting social considerations because it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. All that really matters at this point is that you're American, and that's more important than anything else. As for women, women, as always, are going to take a stronger control on the home front during the war. Um, and this meant that women are going to be doing the jobs that men would normally do during the war and do them very successfully. Um, Abigail Adams, who's going to be a uh, big supporter of women's rights, is going to even give a very important uh, letter to her husband in which she says, In the new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, I desire that you would remember the ladies. He forgets. Uh, slavery is actually going to diminish in the North. In fact, within 10 years of the American Revolution, there aren't any more slaves in the North. It just goes away. It's not part of their economy. They don't need slaves. However, slavery is still going to exist, mainly because the war needed to be paid off. The South has a lot of money. They get that money from free labor. So we're going to have to keep slavery as a means of paying off the American Revolution. It sucks, but it's true. Almost immediately after the American Revolution, the United States faces a problem. We don't have a government, which it turns out you actually need to uh, run the country. You need a government. So the Second Continental Congress was acting as our government, but they actually didn't really have any official power. So we needed to make a formal constitution um, before the end of the war. Really, that all that was keeping the country together was the hatred of the British. Now, what's going to start happening here is that the individual states, you know, the 13, we can call them states now as opposed to colonies, ha already have their own constitutions. They've already made up their own rules. Now, by the way, let's get something out of the way. Constitution with a little c is what basically is a document that limits and defines the power of government. In a couple slides, we're going to talk about the Constitution with a big C, 
that is the American Constitution. It's the same idea. So again, just keep in mind that whenever I talk about a constitution right now, I'm talking about a document that limits and defines the power of government. Now, states had made up their individual constitutions for each state, and they had some things in common. First, they have a fear of a strong executive branch, which means that while they might have a governor or a mayor in charge of their state, he's basically just a figurehead. They have very little actual power. This is on purpose. This is because of the fear of the king having too much power. So they're going to have a very limited executive branch. They also are big on voting, obviously, so uh, they're going to have a system of voting in place. The problem is they have the restrictions on who can vote. Namely, you have to be a white male who owns property. They also have a list of protections meant for citizens, which we will talk about later. And they also pretty much took away all power to the church. The church doesn't really have any governmental authority anymore. Well, that's great. So those are a bunch of state constitutions, but we don't have a national constitution yet. We don't have a means for the national government to protect us, and we don't have a national government at all. So using the state models as an example, the Second Continental Congress is going to start working on a constitution, little c, constitution that would define the power of our government. That document is called the Articles of Confederation. So when you get to AP Gov, you're going to start learning about the different types of government systems. A confederation is a grouping of individual states. The best way to think about a confederation is that it's usually a weak central government. Some examples of a confederation, well, the United Nations is a confederation, and the European Union is a confederation. So the European Union, when they meet, they all talk about the individual problems that each country is, happening, or is having, and they try to discuss them and make a, a solution that all of Europe can agree with. But if you follow the UN at all, they pretty much never do anything. That's because they're a confederation. It's intentionally designed to be weak. The first government of the United States is a confederation, and it is weak. It's going to fail. The government that we create is explained under our Constitution, little c, known as the Articles of Confederation. Here's the idea. Each state, and there are 13 of them, should have one vote. And seven votes would be required to pass a minor bill, which never comes up. Nine votes would be required to pass a major bill, and if anybody wants to amend this document, to amend the Articles of Confederation, it requires a unanimous vote of all 13 states. There is no executive branch, and there is no judicial system. All this government has is a legislature, and the legislature is weak. For example, this document is going to tell you, again, a constitution is going to limit the power of government, the Articles of Confederation could only, or sorry, take that back. The Articles of Confederation had no power to do the following. Congress had no power to levy taxes, which means raise a tax, to draft soldiers, to pay for an army or navy, to enforce the laws it makes, to settle disputes between states, to regulate trade, and to print money. Can you imagine the problems that would happen if you have a government that can't do anything a government needs to do, especially if they're to protect your natural rights? That can't be done here. The Articles of Confederation is obviously going to fail. States are not uh, forced to obey because the states have all the power. No one is afraid of the national government. The government couldn't do anything useful. It couldn't raise money. It couldn't do anything. This is going to be a very, very weak government. It's designed that way on purpose, but that doesn't make it good. Immediately, there's going to be some major problems in the United States that the Articles of Confederation is going to be unable to address. Remember the American Revolution? It cost $160 million, but there are only 600,000 taxpayers. That would mean that in taxes, it'd be $266 per person, which, no, that's not that bad. The problem is the average yearly income is $450 per family. So this is a lot of debt that the Americans are going to have. The Articles of Confederation Congress wanted to pass a small tax to help raise money, 
But the state said, no, we're not going to pay taxes. So it doesn't happen. There is no way for America to get money. America is bankrupt from the very beginning. States refused to give money to the Articles of Confederation, which made the Articles of Confederation look even weaker. In fact, France and Spain are going to begin to question the sovereignty of the United States. The United States can't be a country if it can't pay off its debt. To make matters worse, a majority of the money that the United States made as a British colony was being part of the British Empire and being part of all that trade. Thomas Paine said that we could take care of ourselves and not be part of that empire. But what happens if the empire decides to stop trading with us? Well, that's how we, that's how we plan to make a lot of our money. The British say, fine, you don't want to be, you don't want to be friends anymore? Then we're not going to buy from you. And suddenly, almost everything in North America shuts down. It's actually a really big problem. One ongoing issue of the Articles of Confederation Congress, which they had to address, was the establishment of the American West. A big cause for the war was the Proclamation of 1763, so the leaders knew that they had to open up this area and open up this land to American settlement. The citizens want land, but the natives didn't want them there. So this is going to be a pretty big problem. Congress addresses this by passing something called the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. It's actually pretty much the only success that the Articles of Confederation actually has. It developed a process for admitting new states into the Union. If a state wants to come into the Union, it must, number one, have a governor in the region that kind of controls what's going down. They must have 5,000 males living there. And once the 5,000 males live in a defined territory, they can start working on a state constitution. Once 60,000 people live in that defined state, they can apply for statehood, and their um, state constitution is going to be read over by the national government, and the national government is going to decide if that state should be allowed to, be, to enter the Union. Now, there's going to be a problem. In fact, the Articles of Confederation is going to collapse, and this is the reason why. The Northeast does not recover quickly from the economic depression the war had caused. The state legislatures decide to tax heavily to pay off the war debt, but the problem is not everyone can pay those debts equally. This becomes a major problem in Massachusetts. Where else would a problem happen but Massachusetts, where unemployment is so high to begin with, so there's, they're already vastly unemployed, and now they're going to raise taxes. People can't pay them. They are starving and dying in the streets. This is the very early story of America. Well, this guy named Daniel Shea is going to lead a bunch of farmers to our courthouse to attempt them to stop from foreclosing their farms and to stop them from taxing them so much. They end up at a local arsenal and decide to take over the arsenal. Now, before a big problem can actually happen, the militia is going to step in. A lot of people are going to die. Um, and this is actually a relatively minor event in U.S. history, but it signals a larger problem. The states themselves were not able to protect their citizens' natural rights. The Articles of Confederation here has officially failed. The fact that nobody has jobs, the fact that property is being taken away from people, the fact that people are dying and their government isn't doing anything to step in, that's a failure to protect your natural rights. The Articles of Confederation Congress while intentionally designed to be weak, is so weak that it's completely useless for the citizens. Something's going to have to change. In 1786, a small gathering of a couple of people, perhaps you've heard of them, James Madison, George Washington, and Alexander Hamilton, um, they're going to get together and they're going to discuss about making some changes to the Articles of Confederation. Maybe if they change the Articles of Confederation, they can actually have a well-functioning government. Well, Almost immediately, they decide that the, that the Articles of Confederation is not worth saving, and it should be completely destroyed and replaced. And this is the end of the Confederation period. We no longer have the weak Articles of Confederation. Instead, we have a much better, much stronger document to protect America and to make America work. That document, of course, is the U.S. Constitution. Now. This is the word Constitution with a big C. Now I'm going to be talking about the Constitution of the United States, big C. Remember, little c, 
is the word constitution, which means a document that limits and defines the power of government. Constitution with a big C is the United States Constitution. Well, 12 out of the 13 states are going to send delegates to this convention. 74 guys are going to be appointed, but only 55 actually attend attend to have a discussion of this new document. General George Washington is going to be elected president of this convention. So he's basically going to just sit there and listen to people talk for a long time. And the average age of the people involved in this process is 42. That's really not all that old. I'm sure 42 is actually younger than most of your parents. Yet these guys are going to get together and basically reshape and forge the governing document that rules America to this day. The entire session is held in secret. Even today, we don't really know don't really know what they talked about at the Constitutional Convention. The only information we have comes from notes of one of the people there. His name is James Madison. He took a lot of notes. He's basically a big nerd. We'll talk about him later. Um, but that's the only reason why we know anything that happened here. You might notice that Jefferson, Adams, and Lee are not going to be present here. This is not a meeting of revolutionaries. They need to make a government here. Jefferson, Adams, and Lee are not the people to help make a government. They can tear one down, but they're not so good at building one up. Not yet. There are three major problems that have to be solved in whatever new document these men come up with. Number one, there's no central government. You, you need a central government to run a country. Number two, well, if the, we're going to have a stronger central government, how do we design a government that has power? And how do we um, settle the issue of representation in this government? Finally, Number three, there's a big issue of slavery. Do we keep it? Do we get rid of it? Half the country uses it, half the country doesn't. What do we do about slavery? Now, James Madison, that nerd that took all the notes, he basically had the entire Constitution written before anyone showed up. He basically goes, okay guys, here's, my, here's the idea that we should go with. And amazingly, there isn't a lot of debate about what he came up with. The actual idea of the government that you know it today with the three branches, legislative, executive, and judicial, and um, the idea that uh, there should be checks and balances, and uh, that there should be two branches in the government, like all that stuff that you guys already know, that, all, that was all there the first day. The first day, the first meeting, that was all there. Well, so what did they talk about? What did they debate about? The biggest issue of this new government was who is going to be involved in it, and how is each state going to be represented? That's the big debate. Let's talk about it. There are two theories about how the government should be run. The first one comes from this place called Virginia. It's, it's a state, in case you didn't know. Now, the idea was large states have more territory, they have more people, which means that they're going to pay more taxes. So, because they're bigger, because they have more people, and because they pay more taxes, they should have the right to say what the government does. They should say, hey, we should, they should have more power. There should be more representatives from the state of Virginia because Virginia has more people and is a bigger representation of America. So Virginia's idea for the government is to have a really strong national government, three separate branches, that's all normal, and they want to make sure that representation in Congress, the people that make the laws, representation in Congress should be based on the population of the state. The more people in your state, the more power your state should have in the national government. That, that makes sense, right? We're from, a, we're from in California right now. We are the biggest, most populous state. So to you and me, this makes a lot of sense. We should have the most say. But what about a small state like New Jersey? New Jersey is a small state. And they say, well, wait a second. The size of our, of our state was already decided before this whole government got set up, or sorry, got set up. This isn't really fair that um, they're going to have to, they're going to have a weak government because there's, they're already defined as a small territory. They say, wait a second, it would make more sense if each state had an equal representation in Congress. Each state is equally concerned about the U.S. government. Now, again, to you and me, this doesn't seem to make any sense because you're a weak, piddly state. We don't care what you think. There's no one living there. I mean, does anyone care what New Jersey says? No. So there had to be a compromise. Should the large states have control or should the small states have control? 
The Great Compromise, sometimes called the Connecticut Plan, basically comes up with the government system that we know and love today. We have two houses in our government, in our legislature, I should say. We have two houses. One is called the Senate, which is the upper house, which technically means it has more power, but it really doesn't. Um, in the Senate, every state sends two representatives to the Senate. There are 100 senators in the United States today because... Each state gets to send two, equal representation. The second branch of the legislature is called the House of Representatives. They are the lower house, which doesn't mean anything, and their representation is based off of population. There are 435 of them, and California, being the most populous state, has the most members in the House of Representatives. Go California. The national government under these plans is gonna be strengthened at the expense of the state governments. The states are going to give up a little bit of power in order to be part of the United States government. It's just like the social contract theory. But this argument over who should be more powerful, the states or the federal government, that whole argument that, uh, that we're having right now is actually a major reason why we're going to have the American Civil War. Okay. The next big issue, once the whole representation thing in Congress was figured out, the next big issue that the Constitutional Convention had to decide was over the idea of slavery. The question becomes, should slaves count as members of this government, even though they, don't, they aren't actually citizens and can't vote? The South is going to want slaves to count for representation, seeing as how it's a majority of their population. But the North felt that slavery was morally wrong and that since they aren't allowed to vote, they shouldn't be considered as part of representation. So the question is, are slaves property or are they people? Well, the South wanted to make sure they kept their power. They wanted to keep their power by, um, by having slaves be able to count for representation. And they actually threatened to walk out of the Constitutional Convention and to walk out from the nation. The Civil War almost happened in 1787. It was this close to happening until a compromise could be reached. Congress, or the Convention decided that slaves should count as three-fifths of a person in regards to representation and also on taxes and tax revenue. The only real limitation they put in the, in the Constitution itself says that the slave trade must stop by 1808, but it, the slave trade doesn't matter in the U.S. history anymore because most of our slaves, in fact all of them, are going to be the children of current slaves. So the slave trade pretty much means nothing to the United States by this point. Um, but the South is essentially going to win their argument. They're going to get their representation in Congress, and this is going to be the first of many band-aids put on the Constitution to prevent a civil war. But you and I both know it's going to happen eventually. Now, the rest of the Constitution gets knocked out pretty quick because, again, James Madison walked in with the document pretty much already done before anyone said anything. They decided to have the three branches of government. They decided to have an executive branch, a legislative branch, and a judicial branch. Uh, they decided to have checks and powers and separation of powers. No branch is any stronger than any other. That's actually a lie. The legislative branch is by far the strongest and most powerful. The president is intentionally weak by design, but he can veto laws made by Congress. Um, the president can work with other countries, but the Senate has to approve all treaties. That's the whole checks and balances thing. And again, we'll go over the structure of the Constitution specifically in class, but for now, that's what we need to know. Let's talk about ratification. Ratification is the process of approving the Constitution. Now, only nine of the 13 states actually needed to ratify the Constitution for it to become into effect, but really, it's pretty obvious that everyone needs to approve. What's the point of making a whole new government if not everyone's going to agree to it? Turns out, the Constitution did not have a lot of popular support, despite the fact that it was necessary to run this government. There actually wasn't a lot of popular support for this document. In fact, Virginia and New York, the two largest states in the Union, held the deciding votes on whether or not this would go down. If New York votes to approve the Constitution, the North and Middle colonies are going to go along with it. If Virginia votes to keep the Constitution, well then the Southern colonies are going to go with it. So a huge debate is going to break out across the country over whether or not we should keep 
this new constitution, or we should bring this new constitution in. There are two sides to this argument. The first side are called the Federalists. They argue in favor of the Constitution. They wanted this strong central government. They draft a series of papers called the Federalist Papers, which were essays that were published to persuade people to vote in favor of the Constitution. These are written at a really high level and they're kind of hard to understand. Um, so it really only influenced people in Congress. These are written in secret mainly by James Madison and Alexander Hamilton, the guys that wrote the Constitution anyway. On the other side of the coin, we have the Anti-Federalists. These guys are going to oppose a new Constitution. They believe that the government was already too large, and they would approve a Constitution only if a Bill of Rights were added to give protections to the citizens. Turns out, the Anti-Federalists were a majority of the U.S. population. The thing is, the Anti-Federalists are going to disappear because pretty much everyone agrees that a Bill of Rights would be necessary. So it's going to be added anyway. And as soon as it is, the Constitution pretty much comes into effect immediately. Here are some dates for you. On June 21st, 1788, the Constitution was ratified. And on April 6th, 1789, George Washington is inaugurated as the first President of the United States. The Bill of Rights is going to be added to the Constitution almost immediately after rat ratification because it was demanded by the Anti-Federalists and we can pretty much all agree it's a pretty good idea. Now, there are a couple of common themes to the Bill of Rights. Number one, we have a series of individual rights and protections of the citizens against their government. Number two, we have basic freedoms. Basically, this is the First Amendment. Speech, religion, press, petition, and assembly. Number three, we have the rights of the accused and legal procedures. Number four, uh, we have this idea that we, we call federalism, which says that if the federal government doesn't specifically control that idea, the idea is up to the states. A good example of this would be speed limits. Speed limits are decided by the individual states because it's not in the Constitution saying that Congress can decide what the speed limit is for the entire country. It doesn't work that way. Each state has its own speed limit. And finally, perhaps the most interesting part of the Bill of Rights says that if there isn't a law that says you can't do something in this country, that means you're allowed to do it. You guys, right now, if there isn't a law saying that you, there isn't a law saying you can't do an activity, you're allowed to do it. Doesn't mean they won't make a law eventually that says that activity is illegal. But if it's not already a law, you're allowed to do it until they make it a law saying you can't. And that is the story of chapters five and six. Now that the government's set up, we'll step forward to chapter seven and see how things actually go once we are settled.